question we first have to start with is why write about, why study uh, Gandhari? And we were actually just discussing this a little bit earlier. Um, but Gandhari isn't a, a heroine the way that Draupadi is or the way that Kunti is. She's very difficult to understand. Uh, there are a lot of misconceptions of her. Either she is just a very meek victim of a patriarchal system and someone who is just very devoted to her husband, but never, never mothered her children properly. Or she is someone who is so filled with fight and anger at being married off to a blind prince that she just spent her life in, in vengeance, um, ending with the, the curse of, of Shri Krishna. And so there have always been these, these questions about her, or she's just a very flawed woman. And so the my interest in her was as a child, when I first was introduced to the character of Gandhari, I was fascinated by the romance and the nobility of a woman who blindfolds herself for her husband. It seemed a remarkable act of devotion. Um, and then later on, I had more questions about it. But uh, that was what really set me to, to, to write this story, to, to understand her better. And one thing I realized is anytime you talk about Gandhari, it's very judgmental. Either she is good or she's bad. Either she's a very noble, devoted wife who had these remarkable boons, or she was a bad mother who was blind to the faults of her own sons and who never stopped them from doing very evil deeds. And one thing I realized when I was writing this book is I wanted to find an answer. Was she right or was she wrong in blindfolding herself? And I got to a certain point in the first draft of my book where I was about one third away from the end and I felt stuck. I couldn't end the story. And as it happened, it was, uh, it was an August afternoon like this one in the weekend and I was in the company of my Diksha Guru. Takuji, who comes from Vrindavan, and he was here in the U.S. And I was telling him I'm writing this book, and he, he just said two lines, but those two lines really made a big difference for me. He said, Gandhari is a very difficult and complicated topic to write about. She is someone who Sri Krishna respected a lot. And that was all he said. And that gave me an idea that why are we so obsessed with judging, especially when it comes to women and describing whether they're virtuous or they're evil or they're this and that, when there can be a lot more nuance there. And what I did is then I went back to the Mahabharata, the original source, uh, Sri Veda Vyasa's writings. And when I read it with a new eye, I was a, it was a discovery, it was a journey of discovery for me. And for any writer, anytime you write a book, there should be a discovery and a learning and a surprise that happens. And so what I want to do in this talk is cover that journey of, of surprise and discovery and hope that you also will find a new way of looking at uh, Gandhari. So let's start with just the story as it is presented very simply and directly from the Mahabharata. And the story begins with Bhishma who is thinking about Tritarashtra and Pandu, these two sons who have been, uh, these two um, princes who have been born out of Nyoga and problems of succession with the, with the Kuru dynasty in, in Hastinapur, and he wants to find brides for them. So he hears about Gandhari, this princess, the daughter of Subala. Subala is uh, renowned as a very wise king. And uh, Gandhari is the sister to a hundred brothers, one of them being Shakuni. And it is said that she has attained this boon from Shiva through her penance when she was a young girl, that she, she will be the mother of a hundred sons. So to Bhishma, this must seem like a very good prize for a, a dynasty that has so many issues with succession. So he sends messengers to uh, Gandhara to, to request her hand in marriage for Dhritarashtra, the, the blind prince. Subala receives this, this offer, and at first he's reluctant because, you know, Tritarashtra is, is, is blind and he, he doesn't really want to give away his cherished daughter uh, to, to, this, uh, to this prince. But uh, the Kudus are very renowned. Uh, he has a lot of respect for Bhishma, so he, he agrees to this. And then uh, Gandhari hears that her, her parents have consented to this, uh, to this request of marriage. And she immediately, when she hears that her future husband is blind, she uh, she blindfolds herself. And it is worth, I think, just reading the language from uh, from this this passage. And this is from the the K M Ganguly English translation of the Mahabharata. And it says, 
the chaste Gandhari, hearing that Dhritarashtra was blind and that her parents had consented to marry her to him, from love and respect for her future husband, blindfolded her, her own eyes. And Gandhari, ever devoted to her husband, gratified her superiors by her good conduct. And as she was chaste, she never referred even by word to men other than her husband or her elders. And it's important to pause on this because many times people say that this was an act of of spite and rebellion. And what's important to recognize is even if in that moment that was true, but the very next sentences talk about her, her conduct with her husband and her others, and that she was indeed and in ward a, a true, loyal, devout, devout wife to Dhritarashtra. And in fact, uh, we'll, we'll get to this later, but after the war is over, uh, when Tritharashtra decides to retire to the forest, there is a moment where he he collapses. He's become old, infirm, and he leans on Gandhari. Like he physically leans on her, and she's supporting him and holding holding him up. And in that moment, it's clear how dependent he is on her, how much he trusts her, and he wants her to go to the forest with him. So there is a very genuine bond or or relationship there. So then the, the next thing that happens in the story, some time passes. Shri Veda Vyasa comes to Hastinapur. Um, he's very tired from, from a long journey. And uh, Gandhari looks after him and serves him in the palace. And he is so pleased with her that uh, he offers her a boon. And she, interestingly enough, actually requests the boon that she have 100 sons who are equal in strength and accomplishments to her husband. And this is a very important point because the first boon that she received from Shiva, that wasn't a boon she chose. We don't know why Shiva bestowed that boon on her, but that was given to her. But at this moment, she chooses this boon and she chooses specifically 100 sons that they should be equal in strength and accomplishments to her husband. Not that they're wise or virtuous or, or other things, but that particular boon. And this is a choice that she makes for herself. And one thing that's very important in the Mahabharata and our itihasa in general, is that even though women may not have had the same, you know, if you want to call them rights or the same um, agency that, that we have in the modern world, they did have choice in very fundamental things. And uh, whenever we speak of uh, characters like Gandhari, the, there are choices that they're able to make and there is a level of agency that they have. So it is important to know that this is a boon she also chose for herself. Uh, so she, Veda Vyasa, gives her the boon. Uh, time passes and uh, she soon becomes pregnant. In the meantime, you know, Pandu and, and Kunti and Madri have, have left for the forest after uh, Pandu has uh, killed the deer and been cursed. And so he, he, he renounces the kingdom, in effect, and, and goes to the forest with his, his two wives. Gandhari becomes pregnant. For, for two years, she is pregnant. And if you can imagine, that this mass of flesh is within her that bears a, a hundred embryos. And for two years, she is pregnant. And during this time, it is also said when she was in a state of advanced uh, pregnancy, Dhritarashtra um, fathers another son, Yuyutsu, on a, on, a, on a Vaishya woman. So you can imagine she's perhaps alone, isolated, feeling neglected, impatient, scared. Childbirth is not easy, especially in ancient times. And nothing is, is happening. And then she receives the news that uh, Yudhishthira has been born to, to Kunti. And we all know this part of the story, but I think it's important to put ourselves in that place, to really think about that. For two years, you have been pregnant. You are sure that you are going to have the firstborn and, and the, the heir to the throne. Pandu has renounced the kingdom. And so... You feel very certain of this. You've received this boon from Shiva and from Shiveda Vasa, and then you hear this news. And then at that moment, from grief, she strikes her belly with great violence without the knowledge of her husband. So uh, the Mahabharata is, is very um, is very specific in this uh, in, in this wording. And so she strikes her belly with great violence, with such violence that this mass of iron flesh comes out of her. And she is about to throw it away when Shiveda Vyasa comes 
And she rebukes him. She says, you promised me 100 sons. All that is there is this massive dead flesh. Uh, how could this have happened? And she Vedavasa says, my word is never untrue. Uh, take this, this ball of flesh and it is divided into 100 pieces. And each one is put into an individual clay pot with a little bit of ghee. And he says, in time, they will grow to be the hundred sons that I have that I have promised you. And while this is happening, Gandhari in her mind thinks, I will have a hundred sons. This is a wonderful thing. But she also feels a longing to have a daughter. And she thinks it would be so nice to have the affection of a daughter. And then also my husband will have the the punya where he can attain to the heavens that go to those who have daughters who have uh, who have sons and she 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 feels this wish and she vedavasa also discerns that this desire is in her and so he says he takes another part of the the ball and then uh, dushala the, the the daughter is also is, is also born um and so another two years pass before um from these uh, pots Duryodhana is, is the first to, to, to emerge. And I do think it's important to, again, think about that, that time in her life and how traumatic that was. Actually, when I was writing the draft of this book, I was working with a, a writing coach in the U.S. Uh, she was a, a white woman. She has no connection with India or Hinduism. And she was very affected by this portion of the story because she said, she had gone through a difficult pregnancy herself. And she said, reading about this experience of Gandhari, it really resonated with her how difficult it must have been because she had been through a difficult pregnancy, how difficult it must have been for her. And what it means to really be the mother of a, a hundred sons or a hundred and one children. And it's something because we grew up with it, we almost take it for granted that yes, Gandhari was there and she was the mother of a hundred sons. And it's a it's a common um, blessing that's also uttered. But what it really means to, to be the mother, to, to bear those children and then to be the mother of them and then to lose them. And uh, that grief of losing one child compounded by a by hundred. And we also know that Dushala herself does not have a, a very happy story either. And when she said that, it really resonated with me about understanding from an empathetic and compassionate perspective, the, the very human sufferings that, that, that go on. So this happens, and then you know the, the 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 story proceeds. The next significant portion concerning uh, Gandhari comes at the the time of the of, of the dice match, and this is after the Pandavas are bickering among themselves, and they're they're not sure what to what what to do, and you know there's there's chaos in the in the assembly hall, and at that moment, uh, certain jackals start howling. And this is considered a very inauspicious omen. And two people, Gandhari and Vidura, notice this. And they both approach Titrasha the king and say, he, he, say this has to come to an end. So Gandhari actually uh, says that this is a very bad omen. If he doesn't take a step, the Kuru clan will come to an end. And hearing this, Titrasha understands and he, he brings things to a, to a resolution. So even though in, in many ways, Gandhari may not have had a lot of agency, in her own way, she does a little bit to, uh, to, um, you know, to, to calm the situation. And it also shows that even though she's blindfolded, repeatedly throughout the epic, she is referred to as one who has great foresight. So she is able to discern these omens, understand the implications of them. She knows Parma, even though she is surrounded by a Dharmic people, and even though she sometimes cannot fully follow Dharma because of her attachment to her family. And she is able to counsel her husband, and her husband does uh, does listen to her. And there's another period after this, when the Pandavas come back after Duryodhana wants to call them back for another uh, for another dice match. And at that point, Dhritarashtra also allows this to happen. And at that point, uh, Gandhari has a very interesting exchange with Dhritarashtra. So uh, as you may know, when Duryodhana is born, all these same very bad, inauspicious omens are there, the jackals howling and other things happening. And at that moment, uh, the Brahmanas and uh, Vidra had counseled Dhritarashtra to abandon his firstborn son. 
and said, you have the 99 other sons, but this one will be very inauspicious, will be bad for the for the kingdom, for the family, let this firstborn son go. And because of his attachment to all uh, to Duryodhana, he, he wasn't able to let him go. And Gandhari at this moment reminds him of this, of this moment and says, at that time you did not let him go, but now you see what he has become. It is time to forsake him. But Titrasha does not uh, does not listen. And so the, the period of exile happens. And then uh, after that period, th- this is when uh, Duryodhana decides that he still wants to go to, to war, that he will not uh, concede a single plot of land to the, to the Pandavas. And at that time, Dhritarashtra, Bhishma, Vidra, they're all trying to counsel Duryodhana against war. And Gandhari is actually uh, summoned by first by Vidra and then by Titrashtra to come to the palace uh, to speak to to speak to her son and to try to stop him uh, from from going to war. And at that moment, she delivers very wise words. But before we get to that passage, uh, just think about first of all the the place of of respect and esteem that she had that she was recognized as being a wise person, someone who knows dharma and someone who could potentially get through to to Duryodhana. So there was that place of respect given to her. And she utters a very eloquent discourse on on kingship and on dharma that goes on for many, many verses. And I'll just quote a little bit of that, if I can find it. So she, she says, Those that are of wicked souls may easily desire to win a kingdom, but they are not competent to retain a kingdom. He that desires to obtain extensive empire must bind his senses to both profit and virtue. For if the senses are restrained, intelligence increase like fire that increases when fed with fuel. If not controlled, these can even slay the possessor like unbroken and furious horses capable of killing an unskilled driver. And uh, she says throughout this that victory will go to the parmic and, and the righteous. And so it's very wise and insightful words, but Duryodhana doesn't listen and uh, and, and war, war happens. Um, and then after that, after the war has ended and Duryodhana has been, has been killed, there is a moment when Yudhishthira asks Sri Krishna that he go and deliver the news to Dhritarashtra and Gandhari. And it is asked, why, why did he do this? Why did he make this request? And it is actually said that uh, Yudhishthira was very afraid uh, of Gandhari because she had so much power and, uh, and she would be so uh, stricken with grief at the loss of her sons that if the Pandavas were to appear before them, that they would be destroyed. And so he actually, out of out of fear and out of wanting to to, to finesse uh, her, her reaction, he sends uh, Sri Krishna. And Sri Krishna goes and he delivers the news to Titrasha and Gandhari, and he uh, he comforts them as best as 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 as, as he can. Um, but even after that, after everything has ended. The Pandavas do have to uh, do come and and meet with uh, Dhritarashtra and uh, Gandhari to to take their to take their blessings. And at that moment, she is filled with this grief and this anger that she cannot reconcile. And she Veda Vasa himself comes before her and says, "It's not becoming of you. You should let go of this anger. Your sons did many terrible things. They deserve to die like this." And she says, "I agree with that." But the fact that Pima killed him in such an unfair way, I cannot reconcile myself to that. And then Pima also explains why he did what he did. And then finally, Yudhishthira comes before her and asks for her her forgiveness and for her, yeah, asks for her forgiveness. And at that moment, through her blindfold, as he is about to bend before her and prostrate before her, uh, the edge of his toenail comes into her view. And just looking at it, that toenail becomes blackened. And then Yudhishthira jumps back. Even Arjuna is, is, is in fear, and, and, and he, he, he jumps back. And so throughout, we're given these glimpses of um, this kind of very fierce and fearsome power that she has. 
um, that people around her, that people around her, her recognize. Um, and then there is this very moving and poignant passage, which is when all the Kuru women, this is in Sri Parva, all the Kuru women come to the, to, to, to the, to the battlefield. And she, and they are taken there with Pritarashtra and Sri Krishna is there. And Gandhari has, as a divine vision because of her tapas, because of her chastity as a wife, she has the ability, she's able to see everything on the battlefield without removing her blind, uh, her, her blindfold. So this is described as a, as, as a gift that she has because of her attainments. And as she looks on the battlefield, she starts talking and describing the, the, the battlefield. She describes uh, women who are torn between their husbands who have died and their sons who have died, and they can't tell, you know, who should they mourn for first. Um, some of the corpses are so badly mutilated that that they can't be recognized. And she describes all of this in a very moving way. And she starts naming the the warriors who have fallen um, and, and all of this. And it's, it's a very moving um, passage. It goes on for, for pages and pages. And at the end of that, she turns to Sri Krishna and she says, the Pandavas and the, the Kauravas have been burnt. They was, it, it, this, this had happened. They have destroyed themselves. But you could have stopped this. You have the wisdom. You have the foresight. You have the strength. You have the respect. If you'd wanted to, you could have, uh, you could have stopped this from, from coming, from coming to be. And because you didn't, because you allowed this to happen, then I uh, give this curse that in the 36th year from now, your clan will also come to the same destruction and death uh, that that we have faced today. And just as the women here are crying and weep and, and lamenting and in such pain today, the women folk of your clan will face the same uh, 36 years from now. And Sri Krishna hears this and he responds with a with a faint smile. And he says, I accept this curse and actually you are helping come true what I have was anyway going to do, which is the destruction of this clan. So you are actually aiding me in my work, and uh, and and I accept this. So he accepts this curse with the with the faint smile, and in the next moment he also tells her that, but you should not forget that you are part in this. You had said that victory will go to the righteous, and that is what happened. You know that Duryodhana had brought this upon himself, and this is what he deserved. And he says in one line, you know, princesses like you are born to give birth to sons who will die in, in slaughter. And that this uh, Gandhari falls, uh, falls silent. And so this is kind of where most people think of this being the end of her, of her story. Um, but it's also very interesting. There's, there's the aftermath after the war has ended, after, after everything has happened. The Pandavas return to the, to the palace and they keep Dhritarashtra and Gandhari are there. Vyutsu is also there. And for the most part, they, they treat them as, as their own parents. In, in fact, uh, for Yudhishthira, Arjuna, Nakul, and Sahadev, they really genuinely treat them like their own parents, and they are also comforted by them. Um, it is said that there was one day when, when Pima, who had also was at least outwardly very respectful uh, toward them, one day in the company of his friends, he bragged about, he, he, he slapped his arms, and then he recalled how with the strength of his arms, he had sent the, the hundred uh, sons to their, to, the, to, the, to their death. And he says this in the, in the hearing of Gandhari and Tithrashtra. And they become very, uh, very pained by this. And at a certain point, Tithrashtra says he just, he's just had enough and he wants to go to the forest. In this period, they have been undertaking a lot of penance. In fact, it is said that Gandhari, through her uh, shraddha and through all the different rites she's done, and she does uh, dana to the brahmanas, and through all of that, she has expiated her, her karmic debt to her, to her sons. And uh, Dhritarashtra makes a resolution that he wants to go to the, to, to the forest. And at first, Yudhishthira is very opposed to this. He doesn't want to lose them. He wants them to stay in, in the palace. But others also say that, look, they're in such grief. They've been through so much pain. Let them, let them go. And so it is decided that, uh, that, that they will go. 
And as I mentioned before, there is a moment during this period when Dhritarashtra stands and he just collapses. And at that point, he kind of collapses onto Gandhari and he physically leans on her for support. And uh, the subjects of Hastinapur are, are very much taken by sorrow and pity that that this, you know, this once great king has come to this. And so in any event, they retire to the forest and uh, Sanjaya goes with them and Kunti also goes with them. And Kunti wants to follow them, even though the Pandavas are very shocked and they don't want her to go. But she also feels more comfortable with them and she's been used to staying with them. And also, in a way, while they were on opposite sides of the war, they each understand each other's pain. So it is said when they're going into the forest, Gandhari bears in her heart the pain of losing her uh, her, her sons. And Kunti also has the pain of uh, having lost Karna and whether that somehow could have been avoided. And so these are the, the sorrows that they're carrying. And so they find company in each other. So they spend some time in the forest and there's a, a, a moment comes when uh, after some time has passed, uh, the Pandavas come to visit them and Sri Vedavas also comes to visit them. And he gives them this boon that in this one night, they'll be able to see all the sons that they've lost on the battlefield. They will, they will come back from the, from the other realms and they will be there that night. And so Dhritarashtra and Gandhari are able to, you know, to behold their sons and Kunti is able to see Karna. And it is actually said the Pandavas uh, reunite with, with Karna and, and reconcile with him. And, and then they all go back. And then the Pandavas also go back. And then two years later, there's a, a, a forest fire and Dhritarashtra, Gandhari and Kunti die in that fire. Uh, Sanjay is also there. Um, and then Dhritarashtra basically says, it is time for us to go. We cannot move. Uh, Sanjay, you go. And so Sanjay leaves. And this is how they, you know, they die. And that is the, the end of their, uh, of their story. So some of the things I also wanted to point out, uh, just some, some quotes from the Mahabharata, is there is one quote that is often repeated, and I think this becomes a very important lesson uh, from the life of Gandhari. And it says that it has been said that an individual should be cast off for the sake of the family, that a family should be cast off for the sake of a village, that a village may be abandoned for the sake of the whole country, and that the earth itself may be abandoned for the sake of the soul. And even though in moments Gandhari is able to understand this, and she even counsels Titrashtra that he should uh, he should give up Duryodhana. In her heart, she's not able to uh, to let go of her affection for her sons, and this is what what keeps pulling her back. Even though she has so much foresight, even though she has such power and such austerity, and she's gone through so much so much penance, she's not able to really understand and let go of her sons in in that sense. And this is be, this becomes kind of the main learning from her, her life and also the main, uh, the main issue. And then when Sanjaya summons Gandhari to talk to Duryodhana before the war, he describes her as being conversant with morality of keen perception and capable of arriving at the truth. So this is kind of the, a little bit of the, the tragedy of Gandhari, which is she's able to see the truth in a way, she's much more perceptive than Dhritarashtra is. Dhritarashtra always hears good counsel, but never himself thinks it or, or, or utters it. Whereas in Gandhari, it's, it's inborn, but she just cannot, in some ways, externally, she's not able to do it, even when she tries to persuade others. But somewhere inside her also, there is this, this anger and this inability to accept, which is what makes her... Um, you know, char Yudhishthira's toenail, or, or have this this ability to to curse, which others also which others also fear. Um, I mentioned that she's uh, she's described as being of great uh, foresight. And once uh, what Sri Krishna says says about says to her is, in consequence of the strength of thy penance, thou art able, O highly blessed one, to burn with thy eyes kindled with rage the whole earth with her mobile and immobile creatures. And so this is, this is the, what I said when my guru said, the respect that Sri Krishna has for Gandhari. 
And respect is something that's a little bit different from admiration. So one is acknowledging that this power is there, this ability is there, which is uncommon. And it has been sincerely earned. I, I do think that if she'd blindfolded herself just out of spite, then she wouldn't have developed that tapabala. She wouldn't have had that power to really be able to, to curse or to have uh, to burn the world or any of these things. Um, and yet, such power perhaps could have been channeled differently. So her power is something that is feared, where others almost shrink back from her presence. But if she had used that power to perhaps be a more stronger queen, a stricter mother, a better wife to her husband who had retained her senses perhaps um, to, to, to counsel him, then things could have been different or those are all the what ifs that, that, that happen. Um, and one thing that I, I, I want to bring up is that I think it's very easy for us when it comes to Gandhari to make these pronouncements. And like I said, when I first started writing the book, it was going to be about that blindfolding herself was a mistake. And then I think that's actually not the way of looking at it. That was a choice she made and there were good aspects to it and there were negative aspects to it. But then once it was done, that was her path. There's this line that is, that is said about uh, Sri Ramana Maharishi that once he said it was uh, it was a mistake of, for, on my part to have left home. But if I were to go back home, that would have been the second mistake. Meaning once you have taken your word, once you've made a sankalpa, then you have to live that out. And it's very interesting the way we look upon Gandhari versus the, how we look upon uh, Pishma. So Pishma also made this vow. He made this sankalpa that he was never going, he was going to be celibate and he was never going to father a, a, a son. If he hadn't taken this vow, the entire Mahabharata war would never have happened. And there are opportunities also later when Satyavati comes to him and says, please renounce your vow, um, father some children. We need it for the succession of the dynasty. And he refuses. And that vow is also in a way uh, tragic. And Pishma, when he makes this vow, like he's uh, flowers fall from the, the heavens and he is, he is renowned and, and respected for this vow in a very different way Gandhari is. What the Mahabharata tells us isn't that these vows are right or wrong. It's that you should be very careful when you make such a vow, especially if you're someone where you are a prince or a princess, where your choices do not just impact yourself and your family, but the entire kingdom, the entire nation then you have to be very, very careful and wise and discerning in what kind of vows that you that you make. And I think that's really the lesson to take from this versus getting into a lot of judgment on whether something was right or wrong. Because the Mahabharata is not about black and white. It's about shades of gray and nuance. And how do you live a dharmic life when dharma can be very subtle and very difficult to understand? And that was one thing I wanted to mention. Another is this question of, was Gandhari a, a victim? Did she, was she just someone who had no choice in her, in her life? And I think as you hear the story, it becomes clear she's not just a victim. In that she has, uh, she has an element of choice. And sometimes you can't choose the external situation. Perhaps she couldn't have chosen who her husband would be, but how she conducted her marriage, how she conducted her, her life was in, in, in some ways up to up to her. And neither was she just completely like a spiteful person either, because if she was, then she wouldn't have had that power and she wouldn't have had that that respect that she had earned from from Shiva, from Sri Krishna, from Sri Sri Veda Vyasa. There are also just interesting parallels between her and and Kunti. So Kunti's biggest regret is that her firstborn son Karna was someone she had abandoned, and she is always tormented by this thought of had she, had she um, that she abandoned him, that he he was lost to her, and that he never had his rightful place with his his brothers in the Pandavas. And Gandhari has the opposite issue in that her first firstborn son uh, Duryodhana is someone that she is not able to let go of, even if she says the words that he should be forsaken and in her heart, she can't let him go. And because of that, there's this bitterness that comes to her and this angst that she can never let go of. So that's also a very, uh, very interesting um, parallel. Um, and so 
the other takings of this is the importance of curses and vows and boons. And what if she had asked for a different boon from Shiveda Vesa? What if she had asked for perhaps one wise son or a hundred wise sons or a hundred virtuous sons, how different things could be? And then the other lesson I, I would take from this, which is I think applicable to the Mahabharata as, as a whole, is really reading the text with a lot of care and reading it closely. And I think nowadays, a lot of us are very dependent on TV serials or popular retellings of of, of books for understanding the Mahabharata, and it it doesn't suffice, including my book, that those are just, they can be like gateways, they can be something that ease you into it, but ultimately we have to go back to the original source and read it very closely. The other thing is a lot of times we're very derisive and thinking these are just stories as, as being mythology, as us being kind of very out outlandish stories. And what we do is we don't take them seriously. And that was a great lesson I learned from my writing coach, who I said was this American woman, who really took the idea of being a mother to 100 sons very seriously. And that doesn't mean you have to be literal. It doesn't mean you have to believe that historically X, Y, Z happened. But in a story, in a story as carefully composed and transmitted as the Mahabharata and our Itihasan Puranas, every detail is there for a reason. And there is a lot of significance, um, literary, cultural, spiritual, philosophical, in each of those. And sometimes we're very cavalier in just dismissing these things as, oh, it's just exaggeration and things like that. But really read the Mahabharata with that, that shraddha and that open mind and that taking it seriously immersing yourself in that world and letting that story unfold within you. Because that's how I think you really learn what is the the meaning and the significance of Gandhari. And I don't have an answer to that, but my answer is that there isn't a debate. It's not a black and white. It's not a right or wrong or good or bad. But you, you understand that this is a very complicated woman who had great attainments and also great flaws. And sometimes that's enough because that's what a lot of humanity is. But what can you learn from those those strengths and also some of those mistakes to make our own lives better and to live in accordance with with dharma? I'll I'll stop there. Titrashra fathered another child while um, Gandhari was pregnant. Who did he father it with, and who was that child? If his eldest was actually Duryodhan through Gandhari. Uh, so it's. In, in the text, it just says it was upon a, a Vaishya woman, and uh, that child is named Yuyutsu, and uh, he's actually a, a very, um, he's a very good character, a very interesting and strong character in, in his own right, and he actually um, sides with the Pandavas ultimately in, in the war. So he's a very kind of a, a loyal, virtuous, noble person. And ultimately, like like I said, uh, sides with the with, with the Pandavas. But the the name of that woman isn't given in the text. Thank you. Now I have another question, and please forgive me. I don't have the right words for this. I don't mean insult to anyone, but this is the way I can ask it. Well, when you said Gandhari was pregnant, and you said that, you know, about changing our perspective, being more empathetic, what would it have been like to be pregnant with, you know, hundred embryos? And that struck me because, and I might, I have not read any of the books like you, but my impression was that after she gave birth to the lump of flesh, after that, they were kind of, sorry for the words, split into hundred bits, which is different in my um, impression compared to being pregnant with hundred embryos. I mean, that's not really about nitpicking. It's about understanding the, um, how it worked (laughs) in a way. If you could clarify yes. that, please. Yeah, so that was really more me just um, using like a figure of speech. So at that time, it's it's one mass of, of flesh that's very hard and, and dense. So it's not like a hundred embryos at, at that point. But if you can think like because Shiveda Vasa had promised her a hundred sons. So ultimately, it was going to become a hundred sons. So just still just like that mass and, and weight of it and for being you know, pregnant for two years with that. So it's correct. It wasn't a hundred embryos at that point. It, that was just me making like a figure of speech, but just imagining having that mass of, of hard flesh within you that encloses within it a hundred life forms. 
Thank you, Aditi. That was a wonderful uh, talk on uh, Gandhari, and we uh, got some insight to her mind uh, and what kind of uh, feelings she must have gotten when she was pregnant and all that. So, my question is: first of all, I I always felt that she being a sister of hundred brothers and she wanting a hundred sons, maybe it was something genetic. but like uh, it was it uh, i'm sure is not mentioned in mahabharat anywhere but it seems like it was something genetic in the family uh, her relationship with kunti is very uh, different they are supportive of each other as well as competent like they they, they both are always in competition with each other for their sons so what would you say about that because uh, gandhari had to uh, forcibly she had to like struck her belly to get the uh, sun out bef- before uh, kunti could produce more so would you like to tell something about that yes so that they're both they're both rivals although i i think perhaps gandhari feels that rivalry more than than kunti does um but then they're also sisters um and so in in that moment you understand what a woman of will power gandhari is she hears this news and you also understand maybe her her ambitions as a queen as a wanting to be a mother to to kings and that she strikes her belly that hard basically like inducing an abortion in in, in a sense is, is is what she does and she's how much might is in her that she's able to to do that and the strength of her frustration and her 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 grief and her her anger and at, at this moment and so that is that current i think is is always there and then of course they're on opposite sides of a of a war um but then i think what is most telling is that after the war kunti wants to go with them and it says she really serves them as if they're her own parents and that's her her attitude towards them and Kunti also is not like a a weak or meek person. You know, when the Pandavas go on their exile, she deliberately chooses not to stay in uh in the palace, but she goes and stays with with Vidura. So she has her own agency and choice and, you know, why she does that. So I think in a way part of it is that no one else can understand the the two of their pain other than each other. And at some level, I think there's also a moment after the war when dropadis when when the sons of the pandavas have been have been killed when gandhari actually comforts uh, dropadi and says that you know this was in a way this was my fault that my sons perpetuated this war and all of that and she tries to comfort her and it's really remarkable and, and i'd also mention after this even like the pandavas also reconcile with uh, the with Dhritarashtra and Gandhari and and there is since build a sense of family and this duty and loyalty towards each other which uh part of it you say you may be cynical and say it's political but part of it is i think very genuine um and so there is this genuine bond and i think uh Gandhari also um comes to 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 depend on Kunti in a sense so it says in in that passage when they're in the forest kunti actually becomes gandhari's eyes so the same way uh, dhritarashtra is very dependent on gandhari uh, gandhari is also becomes very dependent on kunti so there is this trust there and so while there is this very natural rivalry that you see come out most most tellingly in that moment when she strikes her belly there is this bond also that that lasts throughout the the, the story so i think it's a very fascinating relationship uh, between between the two of them and that was my favorite part one of my favorite parts of exploring in 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 the in in the book and i'm also now writing a book on kunti where i'm looking at it from the the other side hi aditi it's pranshu here so yeah, well, actually i will tell you another point i don't think they were competitive to each other because once kunti got married there was like about 10 years plus before you know yudhishthir was even born so you know they they had a, i mean there was no competition really to have children really out of the block right pandu goes for those three expeditions there's a five year yagya then he goes to exile and one and a half years into it so i think that rivalry like having to produce kids is more of much late. i mean it was just that one event when she was a little frustrated like you know the kid is not coming out or something so i don't think they were really in rivalry with each other that's what my take is 
but now my question was uh, about the kandhari's role about the dyut and actually in the dyut sabha because her son did basically you know barge into the area which is her his mother's area right and and that when draupadi ran towards gandhari's palace she hit the doors so what was that uh, that was a power play or how would you view that or just a momentarily momentary you know flaw on basically gandhari's side which this starts tries to correct later so i don't think that's actually there in the uh the original text where that she closes the doors on on kunti uh, on, on dropadi and there is a part where like the, the you know the women's chambers are there and, and dropadi is also there and she's in her uh in her cycle and then as far as i recall the the moment when gandhari actually appears as 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 at the um as the pandavas are debating on whether uh, yudhishthira had the right to to gamble away dropadi or not and then those omens are there and then uh gandhari and vidra both both counsel dhritarashtra to to bring this uh, bring things to an end one more point on that which which is true for the first several years um you know pandu is on his expeditions when he marries madri he becomes very you know distracted with her and then the curse happens um there is an interesting moment after the the birth of uh, duryodhana when he's presented to dhritarashtra and then dhritarashtra says oh i i know that i i will never be able to inherit the throne but why should my son uh, not not get it so dhritarashtra at least has that uh, in in the in, in the back of uh, in, in the back of his uh, of, of his mind that you are right like you no know, dhritarash basically you know during the war for was during the time when they were like losing badly you could see dhritarash angst come out okay, how this these these tribal these forest people like you know get these armies and these strengths and everything so he was genuinely not happy with his brother's kids at some point in time and so it comes out during the war for was especially and that's why you know, that that is dhritarash's own ambition basically to have a son as a king that that is true and this is saying that maybe gandhari may not have uh, but you know that uh, the doors thing is about in the, in the dakshinatya in the dakshinatya section mm. uh, so there is that she runs towards gandhari's palace and uh, or either the the shasan catches up before that but there's no there is literally like you know all this description of all these dasis and all these uh, paraphernalia of a palace that vanishes in that sequence where the shasan is intruding so they literally go away. and that is actually a part of that story in if you look at mostly all puranic tales and everything at these certain situations all this extra paraphernalia certainly suddenly vanishes and you have the the antagonist and the victim literally alone in those post, those poses so maybe you know it's just that you know there's a huge palace or something but there the thing which actually reverts back is that when they were arguing with duryodhan towards the end right of convincing duryodhan when krishna was in the sabha right they basically kandhari did basically mention that you know it's not your kingdom we basically and literally this literally disowns duryodhan you might not be legitimate son even like you know she was going to yeah. take that so she does imply that that you know we can actually imply that you are not even legitimate because he was questioning the legitimacy of pandavas literally at that yeah. point in time so he she does go back so that's the thing is mostly dhritarash who can you can say blame for her enforcing or reinforcing duryodhan's entitlement not gandhari at all yes namaste to everyone namaste aditi uh, i i was uh, just listening to pranchuti i think when uh, and somebody else also said that kunti and uh, gandhari were kind of competing ki kiska bachcha pehle hota hai the who who is the older of the um pandus or uh, of that uh, thing so that he can be the king that was more i don't think even uh, the the gandhari and kunti had anything to do with that i don't think they were thinking from what i understand it was more of gandhari being trying to assuage or to go with what dhritarash thought the ambition was always on dhritarash side not on gandhari side of course she would have liked it 
Yes, and at a certain point, I, I think it's hard to to tell. So what we do know is that, um, like I said, she did make this request of uh, Shiveda Vesa for a hundred sons equal unto her husband in strength and accomplishments. And at the moment that she hears, so, so for two years, she's been able to to bear um, this massive flesh, to bear her pregnancy. But then the moment she hears that uh, Kunti has given birth, you know, out of grief, she she does this. I don't know that at that moment she thought, oh, the firstborn has been born and therefore, you know, because that, that it's already done, but Yudhishthira has already been born. I don't think at that moment it's really about the the crown politics. I think it's just a very human emotion and reaction that how could it be that someone who, you know, her husband has taken a vow of renunciation, so children weren't even, you know, really in the picture and she's given birth, and for two years I've been I've been bearing this pregnancy, and maybe she knows that uh, in, in the meantime the has 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 uh, is, has fa- is fathering another child. Or this is very human emotion. So when I say rivalry, I don't necessarily mean like a political rivalry in terms of who will be the heir to the throne, but just a rivalry between women or, or, or sisters-in-law. I think that is a little bit there, at least on on Gandhari's side. I agree that the the actual desire to have his son on the throne that was really Dhritarashtra, um, but there is another human element to it, and and some feeling that uh, Gandhari definitely has, uh, which may not be so much a political as it is maybe perhaps more just a human, a kind of a very human feeling. I wondered, given both Kunti and Gandhari who are very dharmic ladies. Um, how would you describe the salient difference in the way they understood and applied dharma? Like not to compare them with each other, but for a lay person to have the opportunity to look at them, you know, side by side against the backdrop of their different personalities, if that's possible, since you're writing a book on Kunti as well. Yes. So they're both, you know, maybe just start with with similarities. So they're both they're both women who are in their own way very devout. So like I said, Gandhari as, as a child had through her penance had won this boon from Shiva. And uh Kunti, as she's growing up in uh in Kunti Poja's palace, is 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 con- is looking after sadhus and Durvasa Muni is there, and he's a very um fierce, fierce Rishi, and she is able to win his uh his favor and 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 and, and his boon. And even later through so much of the time in, 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 in the forest and, you know, she's in the company of wise men and they respect her. And also I think how she raises the, the Pandavas. So again, I think a lot of that t- gets taken for granted, but through all of the, all of the times, the way she teaches the, them, the way she makes them follow Dharma, you know, when they're in that village after the, after the the the, bur- the burning of the of, of the palace, and she has them, the, you know, the brahmanas are being tormented by this uh, rakshasa, and she has them take care of that problem. How she teaches them lessons um, when Draupadi arrives, and and she says, you know, I, I think it's a very important moment when uh, when she when she says, you know, it, it it should be shared among the the five brothers. And sometimes it gets uh, it gets portrayed as oh she didn't she didn't know what she was talking about it was like this this mistake or something but I think that uh, kind of is a discredit to her I think she understood that the Pandavas had they not been united in marriage with with Draupadi they they would have uh, they would have fallen apart you have five very strong brothers and personalities who you do see at times they fight a lot with each other even during the war they fight a lot with each other. Um, but the fact that they stay unified and they stay together, I think that's really a credit to Kunti and then later to, to Draupadi, how they keep these five five brothers uh, t- t- together. Um, I think as, as I just lost my train of thought. So, And then the respect that she gives to, to Draupadi, the relationship she has with her. So the entire time that they're, that they're going through this, I think she really holds them together and then Draupadi holds them uh, holds them together. So in that sense, her her virtues and her strengths are very are, are very are very clear. And so 
that's, I think, some of what you can learn from, from Kunti. So sometimes power isn't just what happens in the palace or politics or things like that, but some of what happens behind the scenes. And so the, 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 the way that they were able to stay together, the way that they stayed a dharmic family is, is really a, a testament to, to, to Kunti. And at the, at the end, when she, you know, she makes a prayer to Sri Krishna that, um, let my life be full of suffering because in suffering I remember you and at least I, I should always remember you. So so these kinds of things give an example to that. Oh, the other point I was going to mention is when Madri immolates herself on the on the funeral pyre and says, she basically says, I wouldn't be able to look upon your sons as my own, but you will be able to do that. So you take my two sons and treat them as your as your own. And she does that. In fact, Sahadeva is actually her, you know, kind of her favorite among the Pandavas. She has a special relationship with him. And Sahadeva is the son of Madri. So as a mother, being able to take two sons that are not of your your womb or of of someone who at one time was perhaps a a rival and treating them truly as your own sons, that is also that is also remarkable. And she, uh, she, she does, she does this. So those are kind of uh, some of like the, the, the virtues that are there within, w- within her. And, and also, you know, she is in her very, in her own way, very wise and insightful. So she, she's not just a, what I'd call kind of like a meek person. Sometimes I think we think of our heroines as being very meek and passive and, and things like that. So when, uh, when she shares her boon with with Madri, and Madri invokes the the Ashwin twins, then Kunti realizes, oh, like Madri has done something very clever, and I'm not going to share this with her again. Now that shows you that Madri, who is sometimes also portrayed as being very kind of flighty and perhaps just like not a not a very bright one, but she is very intelligent. She made the most of this boon that she had. She is intelligent and. Kunti is also intelligent and they all have their aspirations in their, in their own ways and their, their own ambitions. And so, um, but they're also, it's described the relationship between Madri and Kunti was, was very uh, sisterly, was very fond and it was, was very much based on love. So these things, these are very remarkable women. And so there is a lot to learn from them, not just to be, you know, sometimes I think we equate virtue with being like a martyr or just like, you know, becoming like servile and something like that. And it's, it's not like that. You always look after your own interests, your family's interests in, in a very shrewd and clever way. But at the same time, you're thinking about the larger dharma. You're uh, you're bringing your family along with uh, up in, in accordance with dharma and doing what needs to be done. And I think in Kunti, you see that and she's an exemplar of that, which is why uh, she's also referred to as this one of like the Panchakanya. In, in in our tradition. And so that's the kind of renown that she has, even though, you know, she has this tragedy of, of having Karna and, and abandoning him. So that's the, the the level of respect that is that is there. So those are just some thoughts. I've already spoken a lot about Gandhari, so I, I won't say more there, but those are some thoughts on, on, on Kunti also. Aditi, uh, as uh, I understand, you must have read Mahabharat number of times to be able to write these stories on Gandhari and Kunti. So what's your general view of the women of Mahabharat times? Like their, besides their ma- marriages, because that was mostly political maybe. But other than that, as people, as persons, as were they, like their education or their... Uh, thought pattern or their so what's the general impression of the women uh, in Mahabharata from your point I think as I said the first word that comes to mind is is strong so I think even when you have someone like the the character of, of Satyavati who again is not very much written about but there's this so Satyavati's the you know this, uh, she's rowing a, a, a boat and then uh, Farshar Muni comes and he wants to have uh, intercourse with her. And if you think about in that situation, she's in, in many ways, she's very powerless. You know, she's she's this woman. He's a very powerful Muni and uh, he has a very strong, strong will. And she has the wherewithal and the wit to ask of her, you know, three, you know, three boons that she had the smell of fish that was always on her. So she becomes that uh, that becomes replaced with this uh, very beautiful fragrance. And throughout her life, she's always this fragrance can be smelled from a, a long distance away. 
and that she will, after this encounter, she will retain her virginity and her chastity, and that the encounter will be uh, will be pleasurable for her. So she has a wherewithal managing the situation. Maybe you know the she can't control a lot of things, but those things she does get out of it. So at, at that point, you see that in the worldview of the Mahabharata, it is true that sometimes you know not just women but all people are kind of uh, they're in difficult circumstances. But even the women uh, characters have this wit and intelligence and ability to kind of fend for themselves to the extent that they can. And so that's just one small example. So we've spoken about, you know, Kunti and Draupadi has been written a lot about and Gandhari. So all of these characters, what's really interesting is in the in, in the epic style, you're not allowed to write a lot because you have so much to convey. Everything is in very terse sentences. So you don't have passages that say, Dhritarashtra was thinking this or Gandhari was thinking this. All you have is they said this and they did this. And yet thousands of years later, we can sit here and for we can have like an hour and a half discussion on what and who Gandhari was in a very detailed, fleshed out way. And that's the remarkable nature of what Shiveda Vyasa has composed in our Itihasa, that you have such fully fledged, complicated, deep characters we can relate to in a very human level that we get to know just through their actions and words and very few lines that are given in, in, in the epic. And I think this is true. The women are as equally fascinating, if not more so than the, than the male characters, which says that in those ancient times, our women weren't thought of as just, you know, like reproductive machines or just something like a beautiful statue who you just take as a wife. They were fully fledged three-dimensional characters who had a lot of influence and impact on the story. So who Gandhari was, was very transformative and who who the sons were and, and, and all of that. So it's, it tells us that there was this respect for women as, as human beings, as individuals who are complicated and nuanced, not just good or bad. Um, who are very strong, who are sometimes in very difficult circumstances that we can empathize with, and who uh, who are able to find ways either through through penance or through their own wit and intelligence to 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 look after their own interests and their family's interests. So that's what I would say at a very at a very high level. Actually, one thing you know, again, I wanted to talk about that that the, the air producing and all that this this sort of idea we have with the Salic law and that the firstborn son inherits. They were living in a household, both Kunti and Gandhari. When they came into a household, they were living in a household where they were granddaughter-in-laws of Shantanu, who was the youngest son, whose older brother Bahalik is living with them. Titrash used to daily go to Somdat's palace to hear the music performances. So they uh, and 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 their grandfather, Shantanu's own grandfather, Pratib's father, was a younger son of a younger son. So there was no such idea that it was like you know the elder son succession. So the idea most likely is that just less just a little rivalry that you said that why she struck it. It may be also reinforced by how Zitrash might have been, you know, channeling his ambitions onto Gandhari and waiting on that son. So that's that's the, the if you're writing about Kunti, I would like to say that that you know the, the ladies definitely were not in that race. They were not literally, you know, just means to produce the heirs, but, you know, literally mothers of the next generation of kings, whoever could be the king, doesn't matter, could be even Yutsu. So, and that's what they even tested, right? The the Varnavat was given to Yutsu and nobody came to his help, but he defended it for six months alone. So that everybody basically was a, like a, a a great, uh, like a, was an accomplished individual, even, you know, 11 of the Kauravas were known to be very accomplished, equal to the Arjun and Bhim in war, in, in war and other skills. So that I want to say, this this idea which we keep on enforcing on the on these ladies, uh, Kunti and Gandhari, as if they were in rivalry to produce the next generation, and the rivalry basically did not literally come from them. It literally flew only from that. That's why they said the Trash is the root of the root of the uh, the dharm the adharm vraksh, the vraksha adharm. That's what my my yeah. comment. Sorry. Just a comment here. I don't know if uh, this is you will agree with me or anybody else. Gandhari was a very dharmic woman. But from what I understand and learn from it, Kunti, in spite of being, like having gone through everything, she has raised children her own and her, uh, uh, and Madri's, 
she is still able to cultivate in her own children the three children the same love and affection for their step uh, for their step brothers you don't see them which we don't see in korav clan so somewhere that is my understanding from because i always take it as a learning experience we all have to raise children we all have to live in a social society and everybody has their own each one has his own duty that she was able to do a whole lot more and when gandhari technically this is a somewhere i've read in my childhood also that when gandhari chose to do that go uh, wear the blindfold she actually turned her back and instead that was more of a like a, not helping dhritarash but she for uh, she forsook her duty to oversee her children's parenting because dhritarash was blind by nature he could not do anything but she chose to be so there is yes. there is something that they said she chose to do that and she was she gave up on her duty which was uh, more than what a normal woman would have with all her senses around so, so one thing we should be very clear of is that kunti in that sense is a is at a much higher level than gandhari so even at the end um you know it says like pandu with his two wives kunti and madri ascended to the um to the realm of, of indra um whereas titrasha and gandhari had gone to the realm of uh, kubera so there is a distinction between them and of course as you see you know how the pandavas turn out and they are the the, the heroes and kunti is the mother of the heroes and it's it's because like like we were saying earlier of of what she's done to to raise them in in accordance with with dharma and you're absolutely right and uh, not only do her three sons have that level of affection for um for the uh, for the for, for their uh, step brothers but even for um yutsu so uh, gandhari isn't able to accept yutsu which is part of the reason that he gets driven away whereas they are very um accepting uh, of him for anyone who comes to their uh, comes to their side so that's the greatness of the pandavas and that's why it is a dharma yuddha and that's why they they had to win that uh, to win that war so dharma is there at a different level so so one is observing penance and austerities and then you get tapobala and then you know from that tapobala you have the power to uh, curse people or to to do to do different things now that that is really it's that's like a banking system and that if you do certain things you get like like just like if you save money in a bank you have money a bit builds up and you can spend it on something and then that when that when you utter that curse then that tapobala also all goes away so that's at a at, at a lower level these other things that you're speaking of are at a, at a higher level in terms of what are our character what are our qualities how do we treat other people how are other people you know how do they fare under our watch so in that way you know what's very interesting is that duryodhana was not a bad king so it says that he was an able administrator the people in his kingdom were not unhappy but he um he kind of spent a lot and and things like that so they were, they were okay but that was different from the the kingdom of the pandavas where it's you know there are long descriptions given there about how the subjects were taken care of how Dropadi was the first each of the brothers had their own area of responsibility and things like that so it was a much more dharmic and a better kingdom and so again you know when we're looking at these things there are always just like shades of of gray so in some ways gandhari was noble and dharmic but not to the full extent that uh, that kunti was so that there's a lesson there in the same way Duryodhana in a, in a way was not a terrible king he was an able administrator but it cannot be compared to the uh, to the reign of uh, Yudhishthira so there are these gradations and that also is is there for us to take uh, to take lessons from so definitely these differences in qualities and virtues are there between uh, Kunti and Gandhari while there are some some similarities also yeah aditi so so I would, the, the question i would answer is that no you cannot actually check like the pandavas loved their brothers and duryodhana did not love his brothers we we can't check on that blame it on kunti or even gandhari see that that's the other thing that's why they told you know to leave duryodhana away that's why they said there, there were these 
uh, you know, portents around Duryodhan that Duryodhan is going to be the, you know, the Kul Nashak and all that stuff. And they had advised him. So it's it's Duryodhan really who was in, if Duryodhan was a second born or a third born, maybe, you know, the, the whoever was the first one, say Dushasan, who was the avatar of Indrajit, right? If Dushasan was the first born and he might have loved his brothers equally, we, we cannot do that, right? We cannot blame it on Gandhari that, you know, they didn't love his brothers. Deodhan didn't love his brothers as much as, you know, Pandas loved their brothers or a stepbrother in that case, Yudsu. It's Deodhan's own flaws. We are just reflecting that on, that on back on the mother, which is not correct. That's what my my point is here. And, yeah, so... and, and, and then Deodhan did actually, so there was this uh, very important message, you know, Yudhishthira sends back and he says that people who are, who need help, the people who have been looking for help but did not get it, and people who are born deformed, and they tell them, tell them, oh, Sanjay, I'm coming back. So, see, you, so there was this flaw in Dirodhan's administration. There were some people who were not getting the whatever support or thing, maybe because they look different or because they were born deformed. Dwarfs, that like you know, the word uh, dwarf basically that translates to is used there in the translation by KMG. So. There, that there was a small flaw. That's the thing. There, there was a little flaw. That's why it was different. But again, it's Duryodhan, right? And that's why Duryodhan, Duryodhan was asked to be abandoned. So it's really Duryodhan's own, own, uh, own character which drives very, and he's a very powerful character there, right? And so we we cannot really blame Duryodhan's character on Gandhari's upbringing or Gandhari's uh, uh, being blind or not. Again, you know, that's there, it's uh, Vyas doesn't blame Gandhari for that. Basically, and, and that's not what we're we're doing here. So I think what we're we're doing here is we're talking about uh, Gandhari and Kunti, and a very important aspect of both of their personalities is their is their motherhood. So obviously, Duryodhana is is to blame for his own qualities and failings, which is why repeatedly Gandhari chided him, and um, as you yourself said, uh, disowned him uh, practically at at certain points. Uh, but there is a there's always been an understanding that what a, a mother is, particularly during the time of her pregnancy, does impact her her children and, and and how they they turn out. So that has been a very important part of the tradition. And again, it's not about blaming or you know giving credit. This is about understanding the ripple effects of all these little choices and these little things. And so definitely the fact that Kunti was able to look upon Nakul and Sahadeva as, as her own sons, and in fact had this special affection for Sahadeva, when the Pandavas grow up and see this, it will have an impact on who they are and how they turn out to be. So the, the impact of a mother on a child's character is, is very much important and is like a big a big current that is there in in the Mahabharata. It's not about blaming or, or something like that or holding someone for fault, but it's just understanding these these impacts at, at different uh, different levels. It's a very short comment that uh, we forget a very important player here, Gandhari's brother, Shakuni. And uh, it can be a, like, there can be a very uh, long talk on him uh, alone. Uh, we Let's not get into that, but he has been a big player in uh, shaping Duryodhan's character. Just wanted to mention that. Thank yes. you. Yes, absolutely. And it's, yes, Shakuni is the one who actually brings uh, Gandhai to Hastinapur and then he, he, he stays there and then he, he's, uh, Duryodhan is constantly in his in his company. And uh, in in a way, when Gandhari is chiding Duryodhana, she's also going against her her own brother. So that 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 is definitely a very important aspect of it.